things arise and pass away. And you might say, well, so what else is new? You see it all around you. Why did the Buddha say that your ability to see arising and passing away in a penetrative way is a sign of your discernment? What's the penetration there? It's seeing why they arise, why they pass away. One of his really radical premises, or premises he has you take on as you practice, is that if you sense any change, any arising, passing away, or while something is subsisting, any change in that thing, then it's a sign of fabrication. There's an element of intention in that experience. The Buddha is concerned with not so much what the world is out there, outside of your experience. He wants you to look directly at your experience to see how much you shape it, and realizing that if it's shaped, it's not going to last because the intention itself will change. Intentions come and they go. There are activities. And so the results will come and go, too. Now the question is, do you want a happiness that comes and goes? Most of us pay attention to the coming. You get something you like. You meet somebody you like. Things just seem to be happening to go in the right way. And you let yourself get excited about it, lifted up by it. And then these things turn around and, and crash, and then your mind crashes, your happiness crashes. As the Buddha said, if you find something that doesn't change at all, that doesn't arise, doesn't pass away, then you found something unfabricated. And that can be the basis for your happiness. In fact, it in and of itself is a state of well-being. So that's the premise, that that kind of happiness is possible. And you want to orient your practice to that if you're serious about being happy. A couple of years back I was visiting an, an old professor of mine. He had taught comparative religion. I was going to be giving a talk on, the, on Buddhist attitudes toward happiness. He wanted to know in a nutshell what the talk would be. He wouldn't be able to attend it that night. And so I said, basically, it is possible to search for happiness in a way that's not hedonistic. In other words, you're not just going for pleasure, and it's not just a selfish gathering up of experiences for yourself without regard for how it's going to affect other people. And he said, oh, I wish I could hear that one. Because that's for most people, that's what their quest for happiness is. It's a selfish thing. And very little thought is given to the consequences. Several years earlier, I was asked to write a review of a book on positive psychology to see what the Buddhist take on positive psychology was. And I pointed out that thing the book really lacked from our point of view was there's no discussion of the consequences. You look for happiness in a certain way, you try to find pleasure in certain things, and there was no concern about who was going to be affected by this or what kind of effect it was going to have on other people. The author was trying to be very scientific and saying, well, even bank robbers can have their happiness and we have to allow that for them. That somehow happiness was morally neutral. And so I pointed out that this is totally, from a Buddhist point of view, is pretty repugnant because we have to take into consideration how it affects other people. The editors were surprised. They hadn't thought I would focus on karma. They thought I'd focus on emptiness or something of that sort. The whole point of the Buddhist teachings is that it is possible to find a happiness in a way that develops noble qualities of the mind and actually has a good impact on other people. That's something really important. You look at the qualities of the Buddha that we take refuge in—wisdom, compassion, 
purity. And the Buddha teaches them as part of the skillful pursuit of happiness. In other words, wisdom begins with the question, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What will be blameless? What is skillful? It's a cluster of questions. You're looking for happiness in a blameless way. You want long-term. You realize your actions are going to make all the difference, and long-term is better than short-term. Then there's compassion, the realization that if your happiness is built on somebody else's suffering, it's not going to last. They are going to do what they can to put it into it, and if they can't do it, their friends will, their relatives will, their descendants will. So you've got to take other people's well-being in mind. They love their happiness as much as you love yours. So if you want happiness that lasts, you can't build it on their suffering. And that's the basis for compassion. Notice it's not an innate quality in the mind, but it is one that we can develop. And finally, there's purity. When you really look carefully at what you're doing and look at the consequences of your actions before you plan to do something. Make sure you don't do it with the intention of causing any harm or the expectation of causing harm. While you're doing it, check to see if any unexpected harm is coming up. If it is, stop. If not, you can keep on acting. When the action is done, then you look for any long-term harm. If there's none, you can take joy in the fact that you're training. If you do see that you cause some harm, you want to talk it over with someone else on the path. This, the Buddha said, is how you purify your thoughts, your words, and deeds. So all of this is done in the pursuit of happiness. In a noble way. Try to become happy in a way that develops wisdom, compassion, purity. Of course, the wisest pursuit of happiness is one that goes for happiness that doesn't change. This is where the Buddha's premises about fabrication come in. They give focus to your practice. We're here to get the mind as still as possible. So we can see, is there still some change in that state of mind? The stillness is fabricated, but if you don't get there, you're not going to see the subtle things arising and passing away. It's right here that insight can, can come, and it's focused on just that issue. Can you detect something changing in here? And if you do, then the next question is, okay, what did you do to cause the change? Notice that you look into your mind for the cause. There's a Dharma talk where John Cha is talking to a group of monks and makes the point that they really have to pay attention to arising and passing away, and he says, but that's not the end of the problem. You have to turn and look into your mind. What's causing it? What's pushing that change? Because that's the thing that's going to destroy your potential for true happiness. Again, the, the problem isn't coming from outside. It's coming from within. Some people might say this is blaming the victim, but it's not. It's actually giving you the power you need in order to find true happiness. If your happiness depended on other people, You'd have to go around trying to please them. You'd be their slave. But here you're in control. You can look for the causes inside and realize that you don't have to identify them. You don't have to take them up. You don't have to play along with them. This is why that image of the mind as a committee is really useful. Our habit is to identify with every voice in the committee. But if you can step back and watch them, the different voices, you realize, okay, that voice that's speaking there, I can pretty much figure out who I picked that idea up from or who I picked that attitude up from. And then I'm in a position to ask, do I want to continue taking on that role, taking on that attitude? If you see that it's causing unnecessary stress, why? The important point there is that. Were it unnecessary. There is some necessary stress on the path. 
creating states of concentration, practicing virtue, working on your discernment. That, this involves effort. There's going to be some stress there, so you have to be up for that. But the really amazing part of the path is that it's the one kind of fabrication that leads to the end of fabrication, or as the Buddha says, the karma that leads to the end of karma. It takes you to a place that's totally unfabricated, and it's got this focal point. You look for change, and then figure out what, what causes it. And if you want to see really subtle change, you have to get the mind really still on a very subtle level. That's what we're doing here. And the good thing is that the happiness that's found this way is totally harmless. In fact, it takes you out of the cycle of having to feed and feed and feed. Some people say, well, I don't want to just go for my own happiness. I want to come back and help other people. When you come back and help other people, you've got to feed again. And it's a really good gift to everybody else to take one mouth out of the feeding chain. And not only that, to show other people that it's possible. So this business of arising and passing away, it's not just sitting here and saying, oh, there, there, that comes and there it goes, here it comes, there it goes again. And somehow that's wisdom. That's just the beginning. You look for that because it's a sign that there's some fabrication going on. And you want to find out what it is, why it's happening, to the point where you can let it go. So this is how we sharpen our discernment, by noticing the extent to which we can shape our experience and then using that sensitivity to get things as still as possible so we can improve our sensitivity even further. You might call it sensitivity training, but it's not just getting in touch with your emotions. It's getting in touch with everything that's going on inside. So you can become sensitive to something that doesn't arise and doesn't pass away at all. It's always been there. Always. Put that word in quotes. Because it's something outside of time. Always is a word that's in time. This is outside of time. And that's where we're headed.